a chat um, between uh, with uh, three panelists and uh, Dave Archer, Armour uh, Shlomovic and Erika Portman. So thank you very much all for being here and Daniel, uh, up to you. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank God. I just wanted to resonate with that, that it, we're really excited this uh, being the second uh, edition and especially seeing so many different trends around uh, adopting advanced cryptography and, and sort of these uh, efforts to standardize. So without further ado, I'll introduce our, our first speaker, uh, Luis Brandao, uh, who's going to talk to us about a, towards a criteria for standardization of multi-party threshold schemes for cryptographic primitives. Now, Luis uh, is a foreign guest researcher at NIST, specifically working with the cryptographic technology group and the computer division, security division, uh, being part of the privacy enhancing cryptography team. He's been working on um, threshold uh, cryptography standardization, as well as getting involved with the ZK proof standardization effort uh, for around uh, the community reference. And um, without further ado, please, uh, Luis, we're very, very happy to have you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Let me see if I can share my screen. Can you see a, a slide? Oops. Do you see the full slide or do you see a mm, It's It's not full screen. Is it, uh, is it good enough or should I do something different? I can't see. No, that's good enough. If you, if you click, on, it's good enough, but if you click on view full screen, you'll definitely see the, put the full screen. Is it good? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so let me start by thanking uh, um, Daniel and Tancred again for the for the invitation for this talk. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to to share developments with the with the community, and we also take this as an opportunity to extend an open invitation for anyone in the community to collaborate with the, with the ongoing NIST standardization projects. I am required to make a, a, a disclaimer, which is I am not a NIST employee. Um, I am a foreign guest researcher uh, 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 in the role of contractor employed by Strativia and therefore um, anything that I say should not be construed, construed as an official position by NIST. Okay, having said that, uh, I've been now for three years at NIST as a foreign guest researcher. I've been actively promoting uh, several projects including the Threshold Cryptography Project and that's what I'm going to be talking about and so at least I guess I'll be able to provide some some insight. The talk will, will be uh, fairly high level. The project is still in, in an early stage. And I guess the main point I want to pass is that we really are now in the stage where we are ready to receive um, very concrete feedback from the community. Okay, so let me start here. Um, so I'll give a brief introduction on uh, NIST standards, much more briefer than, than last year's. Uh, and then I'll move on to the main part of the presentation, the update on the NIST, NIST threshold cryptography project. And then considering the, the topic of the workshop, I'll, I'll give some thoughts on standardization. Okay, so NIST is an unregulatory federal agency, which means uh, it's not NIST who's going to say who has to use standards. And in fact, a lot of companies and institutions don't need to use NIST standards, apart from some cases where law mandates that certain uh, NIST standards, namely FIPS, uh, be utilized. Uh, the mission of, of NIST has a number of keywords. One of them is standards for improving quality of life. And uh, that's the setting of this uh, workshop. NIST is a, is a fairly large institution. It has about 6,000 people. It has, is, it's organized in several laboratories. Each laboratory has divisions. And um, the crypto group is within the ITL, which is the Information Technology Lab. And within it, it's within the Computer Security Division. And so uh, what the cryptographic uh, technology group at NIST does is research, researches, develops, engineers, and produces guidelines, recommendations, and best practices for cryptographic algorithms methods and protocols. Let me also point out that another group 
within the computer security division is the security testing validation and measurement group which also has a close relation with cryptographic algorithms namely uh, uh, for the purpose of its uh, validation so uh, we work mainly with three types of uh, documents uh, fips sp800 and nist irs fips are what's uh, formally called standards for for certain purposes federal agencies need to follow certain fips standards such as AES and certain digital signatures, for example. SP 800s are um, documents that are easier to work with at NIST because NIST has autonomy to publish uh, SPs and they often are called recommendations and guidelines. But for the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to be using standards as in a, in a broad sense that en encompasses also SP 800s. And then we have NIST IRs, which are internal reports, which are made public and contain exploratory uh, research, uh, positioning about uh, um, some standardization endeavors, such as, for example, the threshold cryptography. And overall, we interact with the government industry, academia, and other standardization bodies. Okay, uh, so the crypto group standardizes some crypto primitives, and for the purpose of, of the threshold uh, uh, project, we are uh, particularly interested in, in signatures, uh, RSA, ECDSA, and EDDSA. So both integer factorization and discrete log based uh, types of primitives. We are interested in, in AES as an advanced encryption standard. Um, and we are also interested in some primitives related to, to pairwise key agreement uh, and random number generation as well. Uh, let me also point out that NIST besides standardizing cryptographic primitives, it also has standards, which maybe we could call them meta standards. They are standards about how to utilize or how to develop standards. One of them, uh, it's NIST IR 7977, which establishes principles for the development of standards. And then for example, we have FIPS 140-3, which deals with security requirements for validating cryptographic implementations. This, the relevance of this first threshold cryptography is that threshold cryptography comes, I mean, within the scope of NIST as a way of improving the assurance that cryptographic implementations provide. Okay, there are several methods to develop cryptographic standards. They can be, in some cases, developed by NIST internally and then just put out. They can also be in the form of adopting external standards. And then they can also be developed with the close collaboration uh, of the community, such as competitions like AES uh, and SHA-3 in the past. Uh, here are some examples of ongoing standardization processes. Uh, Post-quantum cryptography, lightweight cryptography, threshold cryptography. I believe these ones are uh, at least the first two would be uh, fairly popular, uh, uh, of popular knowledge. NIST also has projects for research, for example, with the research in circuit complexity and development of applications, such as, for example, the NIST randomness Okay, Th this is what I wanted just to say in terms of introduction about NIST. The, the topic of this presentation is the threshold cryptography project, namely the multi-party track, and the goal is to give an update about it and to invite collaboration from the community. So um, why even looking at threshold cryptography at NIST? Well, we are interested in uh, cryptographic primitives and we know that sometimes implementation of these primitives can be affected by either vulnerabilities in their implementations or by operators that go rogue and implement them in a, in a, in a bad way. So essentially we have this problem of uh, single points of failure. And so th the threshold approach can come to the rescue and it basically provides a paradigm where there are several components. And if up to a certain threshold of them are compromised, the system is still able to deliver the security properties that it should. Usually this is, is achieved by some kind of redundancy, diversity, and then everything gets together with some kind of protocol. Okay, here's a, a depiction uh, of, uh, let me see if I can make this work, yes a depiction of a, of a threshold decryption scheme. So in a setup phase, we have three parties that receive a, a, a secret share of a secret decryption key. And um, once they need now to decrypt the ciphertext, each of these parties is going to see the ciphertext and is going to possibly, the parties are possibly going to collaborate between themselves, but without revealing their secret key. And then this will enable them to compute some kind of partial output. And then finally, when they combine the partial outputs, they get secret key, sorry, they get the, 
they are able to recombine the plain text that is the decryption of the ciphertext. And this all is done without ever having had to combine uh, their secret portions of the key. Okay, so uh, the special cryptography project uh, is born so about uh, two, two and a half years ago. Um, the scope is to standardize threshold scheme for cryptographic primitives. Uh, and basically the steps we have at this, the main steps we have at this point is that we had a workshop in March of 2019, immediately after having the final version of uh, our first NIST IR, which positioned our interest in, in um, threshold schemes. And now in July of 2020, we have put out a NIST roadmap toward criteria for threshold schemes. And um, announcing here in first hand in November, we will have a workshop on multi-party threshold schemes. Uh, the registrations will start next Monday. Okay, in the first NIST IR, we base one of the one of the, the the conclusions was basically that we do need to characterize threshold schemes before even starting to say whether or not they're better than a regular scheme. These things include things like identifying the type of executing platform, hardware or software, or is it a threshold design within a single device, or are we talking about multiple parties? The reflection about that led the project to split into in two tracks, which as um, as described by the recent NIST IR. And again, this talk is about the multi-party setting. And then there are other set other aspects we need to look at, such as when we talk about a threshold, to which properties does it apply? Uh, what kind of communication interfaces do the parties have between themselves? And what are the setup and, and maintenance properties of the system? Uh, each of these features uh, affects security in different ways, and therefore we need to characterize the system before making strong assertions about their security. Okay, so we have this NIST IR out. It essentially allows us to pinpoint the kinds of primitives we want to talk about. It puts forward the number of features that we want to consider when we consider criteria. And it lay, lays out, um, outlines the several phases of the, of the project still without a concrete timeline, um, but it's, but it maps how we believe the project will move forward uh, for developing uh, new standards. Okay, so here's a little uh, diagram. Basically, we have a big space of threshold schemes for cryptographic primitives. We have split the project into domains. The first thing, once we are in the multi-party domain is asking what are the primitives that we want to thresholdize? Like we want to thresholdize uh, RSA signatures or AES enciphering or add the SA signatures, for example. But then within each signature, we can also identify different types of modes uh, for thresholdization. Uh, we know that not every conceivable scenario is, it's not good to standardize everything. So we really want to look at the things that have a high need and, high ha and have a high potential for adoption. And we hope to find that out, uh, especially with more feedback from the community. And of course, whatever standard we do, it should be to improve best practices, settle new minimum defaults for security. It should take into account interoperability and it should not hinder innovation. Okay, so in terms of the multi-party setting, one of the focus that we want is we want to focus on the active model. So we want to develop systems that are secure uh, in the malicious setting. Uh, and the current focus is solely for NIST approved base primitives. Uh, in particular, key-based primitives. So we're actually not looking at thresholdizing, uh, let's say, the execution of a hash function. Uh, we know that, are, that there are very interesting uh, schemes with, uh, in other settings, like using pairings and things like that. But within the scope of NIST, now we are, we are focused on NIST-approved primitives. And essentially, we have kind of two, two flavors of complexity. We have what we call the simpler cases, which are cases like thresholdizing RSA signatures, where pretty much we can use some homomorphic properties and we're basically done. Uh, of course, there may be some caveats if we wanna have some sophisticated properties, but then we have much more difficult uh, uh, cases such as, for example, uh, thresholdizing AES, where really we have to start performing kind of more generic secure multi-party computation of circuits or uh, things like RSA key distributed key generation, where we also, even though we might take advantage of homomorphic properties, we still need to use uh, heavy machinery. Um, one notion of interest uh, uh, identified in this, 
uh, in our last uh, NISTIR is this concept of interchangeability, which essentially means that we can, uh, we should be able to replace a conventional primitive by a threshold version thereof, at, at least in terms of its functional output. The, the point I want to emphasize here that I think is of interest is that this does not intend to mean complete functional equivalence. And so, um, there are certain uh, aspects that we are still considering and which uh, may be of interest, of interest for discussion, such as, for example, the case of EDDSA, which is a, basically a variant of Schnorr signature. Uh, it's currently being standardized as a deterministic signature, which where what would be typically the randomness part, uh, the random part is now going to be the hash of the secret key and some other material. Now, if you want to do a distributed version of this, now suddenly we actually have to solve doing a distributed hash, a, a secure multi-part computation of a hash, which becomes uh, very heavy. So one could pose the question, well, just for the purpose of enabling an efficient threshold scheme, should we enable a probabilistic DSA signature? This is the kind of questions that may be challenging to consider throughout the, the standardization process. Uh, in terms of input-output interface, uh, we allow consideration of uh, so basically we consider a model where there's a client that wants to request a cryptographic operation from a module. Once we consider that in the threshold approach, we allow f uh, the consideration that maybe the client wants to secret share the input and only then send it and or may be available to receive the output in secret shares and then recombine. And that may allow for some, some interesting properties, namely with respect to privacy of input or of output. We are also possibly interested in, in notions of auditability. For example, can the client prove or at least be convinced that it, it actually interacted with a, with a threshold version of, a, of an algorithm? Okay, in terms of sequence of phases, um, basically we have four main phases. They can, be, um, uh, they can be differentiated across different items for standardization. But the first one and really very important is that we want to work with the community to devise criteria for, for standardization or for evaluating threshold schemes in general. Uh, after that, maybe then we, we, we will be uh, more ready to make calls for contributions, evaluating threshold schemes, and eventually publishing standards. Again, just a, a, a note here, we are using standards in, in the loose sense and it does not necessarily imply uh, FIPS documentation. Okay, with respect to this first step, we are organizing a, a workshop, a NIST workshop on multi-party threshold schemes for November 4th and 9th. Um, the goal is very specifically to collect feedback from, for the multi-party track of the project. And the way we sort of organizing this workshop is to have several invited talks that will basically give some context to, to some threshold schemes. Uh, but then kind of as a rump session, although maybe not with so much uh, funny talks, uh, we are thinking of having what we, we're calling briefs. So briefs will be five minute uh, uh, talks where that requires registration. Um, and in a sense, it's limited to, to a time availability uh, where we hope that any stakeholder comes and says what they find interesting. And what we want is to collect that feedback. If it's pertinent, then we can follow up uh, again based on on what we've listened, but we really want to have a step where a lot of people has the opportunity to mention the things that they find most interesting so that we can take them in consideration. Um, there are some important dates here. The deadline for early registration is September 30, and hopefully by Monday, the registration page will be out. Uh, just some notes on uh, topics of expected feedback. Um, Configurability of threshold schemes. What are the threshold numbers that uh, uh, are allowed by a particular protocol? Are they dynamic or not? Does the protocol allow proactive rejuvenation of components, for example? What is the practical feasibility? Of course, we want to know that in terms of computational complexity and also in terms of is it really uh, uh, feasible to instantiate a particular setup as it is supposed to, to be done in order to allow things like composability and stuff. In terms of security models, um, should we go all the way with ideal functionalities or do we have cases where it's sufficient to have the game-based definitions? In terms of security properties, there's really a, a big variety of possible options. For example, termination options. Do we want 
a guaranteed output delivery or, or fairness, or do we want security with the board? Uh, what happens if the threshold is surpassed? Do we have a catastrophic failure or do we have graceful de degradation? Um, we are also interested in considering gadgets. And here, what we mean by that is building blocks such as um, garbled circuits, oblivious transfer, secret sharing, possibly commitments, commitment schemes. And also we are interested in validation suitability, namely because once we develop new standards in the future, there will be stakeholders that can only use those standards if they are actually validated by a validation mechanism. So we find that it's relevant to consider this upfront. This is just a slide to read offline, so with a few other topics. And um, let me ask the organizers, how much time do I have? Because we started a little late. You have around another 10 minutes before okay, we great. actually want yeah, to take some enough. questions for Q&A. Thank you. Okay, so now this is, the next points are really very high level, just some personal thoughts on standardization. Uh, maybe starting with what is advanced cryptography, which is the topic of, of, of this workshop. But I thought maybe, maybe it makes more sense to ask what is challenging to standardize uh, cryptography, uh, because I think that's really the topic we're, we're dealing with. Uh, well, here's some, some possible uh, rhetoric questions to ask. Um, once we're dealing with protocols instead of single side primitives, does that increase the complexity? I do believe so, and that's the case in special cryptography. Uh, when we have many paradigms and options to choose from, does that pose a challenge? That, is that what it means to be talking about advanced cryptography? I also think that contributes to that. Uh, sometimes we might be dealing with complex techniques or assumptions that have not been previously standardized or, or scrutinized. I believe that's also uh, something that makes standardization more difficult. Although I, I think that this third topic does not apply uh, with so much strength as the previous two with respect to threshold cryptography. Um, and then for example, do people have uncertainty about uh, whether standards will be adopted or not? Um, in any case, uh, I'd like to, to put forward that uh, we can move towards standardization of, of, of advanced crypto by doing preliminary work that is not traditionally called actual standardization. So for example, developing collaborative reference materials such as for example, ZK proof is, is doing at this point is a very helpful uh, step towards standardization, uh, be it for whichever uh, standardization body. Deployment of application use cases that will attest for the feasibility and enable benchmarking of techniques before they are standardized is also something that typically gives more confidence for things to be standardized. And so at least from the NIST side, and again, this is just a personal view. Um, um, sorry, I had a blank here. Uh, from the NIST side, it's useful that we look at standardization of things that actually have been attested and possibly are already uh, standardized in, in other domains. So we don't necessarily have to start from scratch in order to standardize something. And also uh, deployments that can improve best practices and interoperability prior to standardization. That's another thing that can help future standardization. Okay, so um, having said that uh, standardization can benefit from preliminary steps, I think there's a point of interest, which is the, the standardization process is not really just the point of writing the final document. It really includes the whole process of choosing and devising uh, which techniques to standardize. And in particular, I believe that the, the standardization process itself affects the kind of, of, um, of primitives that one is going to standardize uh, and may itself promote research that in the end of, of the day, in the end of the standard is going to make a difference. So for example, the process itself will include having to make decisions about what kind of contributions do we want to call for by the community. Do we want to call for, okay, now please give us your preferred threshold schemes, or do we want to ask for contributions like, just give us first some research results or reference implementations, and then we'll take another step. Uh, and again, also the development of criteria is also something that can affect the end result. Another point that I'd like to emphasize is that, at least for us, Collaboration between stakeholders is really one of the prime factors that we want to take in consideration in the standardization endeavor. Um, having stakeholders, uh, so stakeholders can 
for potent validate techniques that would be considered for standardization. It can be the stakeholders to motivate the use cases and the modes, let's say the threshold modes that are of interest. It's the, stake, it's the external stakeholders that a lot of times can scrutinize the complex techniques being specified. And really without the, the engagement of stakeholders, uh, a standardization body is very much reduced as compared to the, the whole community uh, together. Also, I think there's a point that sometimes it's easy to forget that human resources are finite, both at the stakeholders level, but also at the standardization bodies uh, level. Uh, and this also brings another point, which is one, one important factor in standardization is to really have timelines that allow proper time for public scrutiny, or otherwise one could have the credibility affected. And in the end of the day, the end game is to achieve trustworthy and trusted, globally accepted and adopted good standards. What are good standards? Well, the, they are the standards that promote all the good stuff. And they're also the standards that do not hinder innovation. They are the standards that if they become obsolete, they have a way of being uh, replaced by, uh, by new ones. And they are standards that enable suitable validation mechanisms that prevent uh, certain types of errors that could be otherwise catastrophic. Um, let me see, I guess I still have like four minutes. Okay, so I can still go through this slide. One question that um, has arose several times since the beginning of, the, of, the, of this project was how are we going, what is it that makes sense to standardize? Are we going to standardize ideal functionalities so that people, then people can bring their preferred protocols and just prove that they emulate the ideal functionality and, and the problem is solved? Or are we going to standardize concrete protocols and then everybody's going to be upset because uh, well, the next month there's a, there's a better one and, and now we can't do nothing about it. And also there's this aspect of um, building blocks, like uh, should we standardize a garbled circuit and then use it to construct something else or should we go for generic constructions? And one of our views currently is that all these elements, again, belong to the process. So we want to consider ideal functionalities as a step of the process, namely as a criterion for, um, for developing protocols. But in the end of the day, we do want to be able to standardize some protocols because otherwise we would not be solving the validation problem and we would just be settling ideal functionalities that then can have a hundred different instantiations and then the validation labs simply do not have the ability to validate, at least not more than somebody reading a paper, let's say a new paper at, at script or something like that. And so all these parts can play, uh, 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 can play together and in particular, as I mentioned, there are some gadgets that we are interested in, in, in looking at. Maybe this, we don't want to do standards about these gadgets, but we may want to be able to do, let's say, reference definitions of these standards so that then they can be reused in standards and can make standards more flexible. Okay, and as final slide concluding remarks, um, so NIST has several ongoing standardization initiatives such as PQC, Lightweight and Threshold. NIST is also interested in accompanying the developments of advanced cryptography, be it for these projects or others. Not everything should be standardized, but some things should. Um, hopefully, the things that will be standardized will enable security and interoperability and improve best practices. Um, official standardization can be preceded by valuable phases, such as developing reference material. So the fact that NIST is not actively working on a particular on standardizing a particular uh, uh, advanced cryptography technology does not mean that there's no interest in, in that. And as a final point in these five points, the development process matters. And just to finalize, again, we're going to have a workshop in November 4th to 6th. Please consider contributing with your point of view. This is an exciting time to collaborate new, towards new standards. I found interesting to keep the same slide I had from the previous presentation, just because it's cool. Um, basically asking what are the, how will standards be in, in 70 years from now? Probably some rocks of the wall will have uh, collapsed, but maybe some others will, will keep present. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, any feedback is appreciated. And feel free to email or just ask questions. Thank you, Luis. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions on the Tulip chat. So maybe uh, does Shai want to ask his question? Uh, 
Yeah, it's a high level question. Just uh, the philosophy of the program seems to go well with also the concept of robust combiners will, you know, actually use different primitives. And if there was a cryptanalysis. I'm, I'm sorry, Shai, I, I'm not being able to, to listen. Uh, let me, could, could you please restart? Uh, the question is whether uh, discussion of combiners where uh, you also protect, you, you use a couple of primitives and you protect against the case that one of them is broken. Uh, is that um, discussion part of, the pro of this program? You mean combiners such as, for example, let's say OT combiners where... Yeah, yeah. Okay. so for encryption and signatures, maybe the discussion is trivial, but maybe not, I don't know. So our focus is on uh, NIST approved primitives. So I would say that uh, as a starting point, at most we would be looking at combiners of those uh, NIST approved primitives, such as AES or signatures. Um, I guess the second level uh, consideration would be if there are combiners that are used as building blocks to enable uh, uh, this threshold version of NIST approved primitives, then maybe they would be considered. So let's say if we have if we have a NIST approved primitive, let's say an RSA distributed key generation that needs to use oblivious transfer as a part of a, of a secure multi-party protocol. If the best technique for a particular future standard would be to actually have an oblivious transfer that somehow uses this combiner notion, then I think that would be reasonable to consider. However, at this point, we do have a strong focus on NIST approved primitives and so we would not be doing combiners of other primitives just just on their own stake. Thank you. Thank you, Shai. Um, Steve, uh, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, Luis, thanks for your talk. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask about this uh, point that you brought up. I think it's a very uh, key point that this is talking about you know, the you know, threshold cryptography standardization is kind of different in the sense that it's trying to look at protocols as opposed to uh, standalone primitives. And I was just wondering if it might be worth uh, distinguishing between uh, gadgets that can be broken down into more or less uh, stateless uh, sub gadgets like, uh, you know, garble and eval or uh, split and reconstruct uh, as opposed to more, you know, inherently interactive schemes. Yes, I, I think that is a useful consideration. So for example, I actually didn't include in the slide, but we could consider, let's say, consensus as a gadget. Um, and that, that one would be uh, inherently a distributed, a distributed gadget. Um, I think one way in which we look at gadgets is, are we able to encapsulate reference definitions of certain things that once they're well-defined in terms of, of actually then later on writing an actual standard, we don't have to start from zero and we can kind of refer, as mentioned in that NIST IR, uh, here we, we should use, um, let's say an approved consensus gadget or an approved garbled circuit gadget. But coming back to your question, I think it is a, a very pertinent aspect and we have actually not done that explicitly uh, so far, but probably it would make sense to do so, to, to differentiate between um, uh, I don't know how to call it, single party gadgets versus uh, distributed gadgets. I think that's a good point. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Is, are there any more questions? Uh, maybe maybe I can ask a question. Ask. Uh, can I ask a question? Okay, so uh, this is Evgeny um, Dodis. Um, I'm curious um, how important, it looks like mainly you're interested to standardize uh, standard you know, non-interact, uh, sorry, uh, uh, single party primitives that uh, people already use, like ECDSA, um, some kind of, uh, uh, I guess, RSA signatures and so on. Uh, usually those uh, threshold schemes for them will be interactive and kind of painful. Uh, there is this part of research about non-interactive threshold schemes where basically they're super convenient in practice. You just send an input, uh, some servers don't respond, some response, you collect one output and just get the output. But the scheme, the problem is that the schemes get uh, less efficient, maybe use pairing, it's more complicated. But I would imagine people would really love in terms of uh, implementation just to have a non-interactive threshold scheme. 
I know it's early. How do you envision this process? Will could there be two tracks, one for slower schemes, but which allows this huge convenience of non-interactive, uh, in, you know, threshold implementation? Or you think that they'll never fly because those schemes are slower? Well, uh, if if they are uh, feasible in practice, even if slower, I think there will be there are application use cases for it. So maybe you have, uh, let's say, a, a, an application use case where you want to generate a a distributed uh, RSA key generation, you want to do that once, maybe it takes you an hour, you're fine with that because now you're going to use that for uh, for a year of time. Um, I'm not sure, but I would imagine that the types of schemes you're considering actually do require an initial uh, interactive setup phase in order to then uh, execute. But but in, 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 in any case, uh, Definitely, those would be schemes uh, of interest. And for example, just to pick the case of um, uh, RSA threshold signatures, which is really a very basic scheme, it kind of allows that. Once the key secret shared, uh, parties can can operate on their inputs uh, separately, and then just provide their their partial outputs, and then it's a, just a very simple combination in the end. So. If there are ways of doing that for things like ECDSA and others, that would be great. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, I mean, I didn't specifically recently looked in uh, signatures, but for example, for chosen separate secure encryption, actually Shai has uh, uh, at least one super nice paper about it, but my understanding is that the only non-interactive schemes uh, heavily use pairings um, and some pairing verifications and so on, so then I, I would imagine they're feasible. You just need to do a couple of pairings, but obviously much uh, slower than probably even Kramer Schub or something like that. But schemes which inherently seem to inherently require interaction. So maybe specifically for encryption, do you envision? Uh, yeah, I don't mind the uh, slow key generation yes. thing, but like everyday operation. Evgeny and Luis, I'm sorry. I, I would like to ask you if, if possible, maybe we can take this uh, offline, topic sure. on, uh, discussion on, offline. I think the the Tulip chat would be definitely a great the great place to to take this conversation. Okay. I, we just want to make sure we're on time for for the rest of the, of the sessions. Um, thank you again, Luis. Let's uh, give uh, Luis a, uh, a, a warm thank you. Uh, digital claps you. or however you you want to see it. Um, before we introduce our next speaker, I just would like to point out that uh, at around 3.30 UTC, or basically right after this first session on standardization, we're going to have a shared uh, social uh, networking event with the other workshop that is happening right now, and um, the link will be available uh, soon enough. So, um, Tancred, would you like to uh, introduce our next speaker? Yes. Thank you very much. So um, we're really lucky to have uh, Kim Lane from Microsoft Research, who's going to give an update on the fully homomorphic uh, encryption effort. Um, so Kim has been a principal researcher in the cryptography and privacy research group in Microsoft Research for many years now. He leads the development of the homomorphic encryption library SEAL. Um, and is one of the co-founder and is in the steering committee of uh, homomorphicencryption.org. So, Kim, up to you. All right. Thanks, Tancred. And thanks for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Let me just try to figure out how to, how to uh, navigate this. How do I... Ah, this control bar. So helpful covering my... Okay. Can you see this? It's not full screen, but we can. Oh, no, it's, it's full not, screen, so it's good. It is, it is full screen, yeah. Okay. All right, excellent. All right, so. Um, uh, thanks for the introduction. Indeed, I, I'm a principal researcher at Microsoft, but uh, in this talk, I mainly represent the steering committee for homomorphicencryption.org. And uh, I'm hoping to give an update on like what homomorphicencryption.org is, first of all, and then uh, what homomorphicencryption.org has been doing over the past, past years, and what it is doing now, and what the path forward is. Now, 
why standardized fully homomorphic encryption? Uh, there's many answers and, and um, this question is something that uh, has been asked repeatedly over the course of the existence of this group. Uh, some answers are like um, very high level, for example, the tech is premature, lack of standards can hinder deployment. But then there's also kind of low level answers like uh, developers need help in using this technology or uh, the library developers need need to have uh, maybe help in understanding what is a good direction to, to develop their tools and libraries. Uh, there's also reasons like interoperability that was also mentioned in the previous talk. Uh, there's also security reasons because uh, of course for a cryptography standard it's really important to <laughs> focus on security and this has been our, our uh, focus from the beginning our like number one focus from the beginning uh, we know that only minor changes in the security estimates have come over the past years uh, since this group was created so we believe that it is secure as well so why not standardize there are many companies some some bigger companies some smaller companies that are looking to use uh, homomorphic encryption fully homomorphic encryption or at least uh, use fully homomorphic encryption as a part of something I mean, usually i guess uh, you can use it to build all kinds of protocols you can use it for for mpc uh, pre computations as well and uh, of course, most of these uh, constructions are based on LWE or RLWE, and at this moment, we have high confidence in these primitives. Well, I already talked about homomorphic encryption.org, but I didn't really say what it is. I, I think many of the audience, many people in the audience know about this as an, kind of an informal group created at the, at the workshop at Microsoft in 2017. It's informal in the sense that there is no, um, it's not a formal organization or anything like this. There is a steering committee that is kind of making decisions of, of when, for example, the next workshop is organized and uh, what the direction of, the, of this operation is. The workshop, the, the initial workshop at Microsoft resulted in three white papers that kind of set the course or the the high level uh, focus points for this uh, group. And those were security, API and application. So the thought and the idea was that we need to start with security. We need to uh, make sure that everyone understands how the security, uh, you know, how the, what the security uh, properties of these schemes are, uh, that uh, why they are considered to be secure, what the hard problems are, what the attacks are. And uh, for API, we were thinking that, well, it's not really clear what should be in a homomorphic encryption standard. So we wanted to, we had this like little working group uh, that created a white paper about the APIs for homomorphic encryption, just trying to um, somehow consolidate maybe the, the knowledge and information that we have about the, the APIs and the ways of using these schemes. Finally, applications was about um, bringing together people who have looked at applications and trying to understand what are the most interesting classes of applications. Of course, the standard has to serve the most interesting classes of applications. Otherwise, it's a useless standard. Now, in subsequent workshops, a lot of changes have happened to these, but still uh, we have a few of these focus groups or these, uh, these topics. Security remains security, and security remains important. Uh, but for API, we've kind of switched more towards usability, thinking about different ways of how can we make this easier to use. Maybe it doesn't make sense to standardize the API. That uh, we've kind of shifted away from that because the different schemes have very different API requirements. Different libraries do very different things. Uh, but maybe we need to think a little bit about usability. Maybe it's not gonna be a part of the standard, but, may, but it's definitely something that the standards, um, well, that homomorphic encryption.org needs to look at and think about. And finally, we've added a new focus uh, group on standards organization engagement. Well, one of the 
most important deliverables of this group has been the homomorphic encryption standard. So this is like a community standard at this moment. But uh, and the, the most important thing of this document is you can, you can see the first page uh, of it here is the these like security tables that say that, well, if you set your parameters to be like this, then you have 128 bits of security. And this has been really important in my opinion because um, it has allowed the different library developers to kind of um, standardize how the, how the parameters are selected, what kinds of parameters to use. It has allowed academic, academic uh, researchers to kind of uniformize what parameters to use in papers and so on. Well, here's, a, here's an example table from this document where you can see that uh, for different, uh, oops, for different uh, parameters n for a specific uh, um, key distribution, for different parameters of uh, different values of n, we get, if you want to get the specific security level, like, like for uh, dimension 4096, if you want to get 128 bits of security, we can, we can use uh, this like ciphertext modulus parameter uh, to be at most 111 bits. Slightly more recent uh, attacks, like more recent attacks change these estimates slightly, but uh, it's quite insignificant, which is one of the reasons why we believe that we can trust this technology. Well, here's the jolly group from the first workshop. You can probably recognize a lot of familiar faces there. Yeah, good times. Um, there were some follow-up workshops that we've organized now. So the first one was at Microsoft. The next one was at MIT, uh, hosted by Vinod. And then at University of Toronto, hosted by Glenn Gulak. And this was uh, co-located with CCS. And then the next one after that was uh, uh, hosted by Intel in Santa Clara. Well, this was last year. Uh, and uh, what has happened with the, stand with the homomorphic encryption that org is that it's definitely shifted more from the academic direction to the, to the industry or from like academic focus to industry focus. Now we have we had like 19, over 19 companies attending the Intel workshop. And what we have for the future is, uh, we've planned a, a workshop in Geneva, hosted by EPFL, and a workshop in Seoul, hosted by Samsung. So unfortunately, these were actually both supposed to happen this year, but um, well, things happened. So, so they are postponed until next year. Uh, this year, in February, we also organized uh, what we call the strategic planning meeting for the, this was, a, this was not like one of the standardization or standard homomorphic encryption.org uh, kind of standards meeting. This was, a, this was a meeting for community leaders and the stakeholders in homomorphic encryption to discuss what the community priorities should be for the upcoming years. This was a, this was a working, week, a working meeting where we created more white papers. For example, we wrote some understandable and accessible white papers describing different schemes. And we also wrote up some application scenarios because those haven't really been revised since the very first uh, workshop. Now, we also discussed the plans for and, and, and ideas for standard organization engagement. Now, Something I did want to mention about this is that um, all the material that we created in this meeting, we're hoping, hoping to publish it in a special volume with Springer. And uh, in this volume, we're also actually at Microsoft, we also organized this private AI bootcamp last December, where we invited PhD students to, to um, kind of innovate and, and uh, come up come up with cool ideas and applications with homomorphic encryption and to learn about, learn about the topic. And we're hoping to publish those papers, those write-ups and papers also in this uh, special volume. Okay. Um, 
Now, what are the elements of a standard? One of them is uh, availability. So of course the technology has been, uh, must be available and uh, it is available. There's multiple actively developed libraries and I think many of these, uh, some of these authors probably are listening to this talk. Authors of these libraries are listening to the talk. And as you can see, there's a, not that many different schemes that are being implemented. A BGV, CKKS, BFV, TFHE, uh, these are definitely the most interesting and the impo most important schemes at this moment. Well, something that we don't have as much as, as libraries is tools or tooling around the libraries. For example, well, something that many groups have looked at recently is, is compilers or, or automation tools. Maybe that's a more correct way of saying this. Automation tools that can help you in, in selecting parameters, for example, for the encryption scheme or optimizing, optimizing the computation. Jim, there's two more, two more minutes for the talk. All right, all right, sounds good, sounds good. Um, we're also looking at hardware acceleration and uh, oh, we also would want to have hardware acceleration and some debugger, debugger slash uh, IDE support. Well, um, security, like I already said, we trust this to be hard. Now, um, what I really want to mention here, which is uh, the very important update, is our engagement with uh, the standards organization. So we have, um, we need an international standard. This is needed for commercial use. So what homomorphicencryption.org did in March was we presented to ITF. And uh, there's also been a lot of interest from ITUT. But uh, we found actually that this ISO IEC uh, JTC1 SC27 working group two is a very natural home. This is where uh, Pascal already has uh, kind of uh, been driving this partial homomorphic encryption standard. So there is a homomorphic encryption standard already. Now we want a fully homomorphic encryption standard. There's also two standards on secret sharing and I, I guess the MPC Alliance is working with working group two. We uh, presented to the ISO IC, uh, this working group two, in a plenary meeting on April 21st. And there was a unanimous decision to start the six month study period. Uh, so currently this six month, six month study period is going on and we're actually accepting contributions uh, for the September, for the next plenary meeting, which is in September. So you can see here the list of uh, co-rapporteurs for this. Uh, the effort was uh, mainly driven by Ro from Intel and myself. And we would also want to thank NIST, uh, Lily Chen from NIST and uh, Laura, Laura Lindsay from Microsoft and Grace Way from Intel for their support and help. So we're currently looking for contributions, specifically uh, the study uh, period is looking to answer the following questions. Like what is the expected demand? Are fully homomorphic encryption schemes secure? Is the state suitable for standardization? Um, what standardization uh, strategy would be useful for and, and helpful? For example, should this extend an existing standard or should it be a new standard? And uh, or are, are there any other topics that should be discussed in this study period? Well, if, if uh, everything goes well, one of the elements of the standardization, of course, is hard work. So if the working group two decides to start a new standard, then uh, there's definitely a huge amount of work to do. Uh, but that's a good thing. Uh, so that's all. Any questions? Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. So um, if someone has a question, just speak up, otherwise I'll ask one actually. Okay, so, so I actually have a question. So do you foresee that the standardization will be about um, a somewhat amorphic encryption where we bound the number of like, like I don't know, or do, do you foresee that the standardization will really be about fully amorphic encryption for any scheme or maybe it will be, you know, both will be standardized at ISO? Uh, so I'm not sure what you mean. Um, you're talking about when you say somewhat homomorphic, what do you mean by that? So, so what I'm wondering is, uh, do you think uh, standards on fully homomorphic encryption should necessarily specify a bootstrapping for oh, I see, like I see. every scheme that would be presented? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, no, I don't think so. Some, some schemes seem to be 
more suited for bootstrapping. Some schemes uh, seem to be more successful in the leveled mode, and I I don't I can't imagine that uh, it would somehow make sense to to standardize the like bootstrapping operations. So in fact, I'm not even sure it makes sense to standardize the operations at at all that can be done on the encrypted data. So we'll have to see where this goes. It's really not clear. Like it's it's not clear if because different schemes have like uh, different kinds of operations. I, I wonder if uh, one of one possibility is just to standardize some of those uh, RLW or LW security parameters. This is, or maybe even just the methodology for selecting those parameters or estimating their security. Like this is a very minimal thing. But then I guess we would also want to describe the uh, some of the schemes, uh, especially in, of course encryption and decryption. So then the question becomes. Uh, do we need to also describe all of the possible operations? Mm, maybe because like, we want to make it uh, use of kind of something that is helpful and useful for implementers and, and users. Uh, well, what about things that may or that are like really difficult? Like bootstrapping is is very complicated to do in some of these schemes. Um, not sure, but I, I I would be I don't think it will be included, at least in the first version of the standard. Okay. Thank you very much. So if there is no other question, maybe we can go to Daniel. Yes, sounds good. Um, so I just wanted to say quickly uh, for the next two talks, just so that we don't go too much over uh, the break, we'll keep it to 20 minutes. So two minutes before the end, we'll uh, try to, to cut it so we have a, uh, a question or two uh, on the talk. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Yael Kalai, uh, who is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research and associate adjunct professor of computer science at MIT. Uh, Yael got her PhD at MIT where her thesis has been recognized with the George M. Sproul's PhD thesis award in 2006. Uh, she's a, a prolific researcher uh, in several fields in cryptography, theoretical cryptography, and she is currently a member of the steering committee of the uh, ZK proof standardization effort. So she's going to share with us today an update and vision of the ZK proof effort. Um, thank please, yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Let me just share screen. Okay, can you guys see this? The screen? Yeah, okay. So first, thank you so much, Daniel and uh, Tancred for organizing uh, this workshop. Uh, don't worry, I'm going to keep it brief. I'm going to try to go below 20 minutes so, to save some time, uh, especially because a lot of the things that I plan to say were already said. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I want to kind of mainly give uh, my, uh, you know, opinion or my view of kind of this ZK proof uh, process, standardization process, uh, which by now I think of it much more as just standardization. It's actually been much more, uh, I don't know, broad than that. Uh, so uh, for my story, this all started when Shafi approached me at MIT and told me, you know, people are starting to use zero knowledge proofs, it's using practice, it's, you know, really exciting, and it's our job to make sure this is done right, uh, let's start this kind of uh, standardization process. Well, we'll tell people, you know, what's the best way to use uh, zero knowledge. This was shortly after the FHG standardization process started and it seemed like a big success. So uh, that was kind of where things started. And uh, so at that point, at least from my perspective, the goal was really to just kind of create an agreement of when people want to use ZK proofs, zero knowledge proofs, what should they use? What is the right zero knowledge proof for them to take? And, you know, of course, for those who haven't thought about it before, it seems like it may be a simple question, but it's actually quite uh, the contrary because there's so many variants and this kind of came up uh, when Luis has talked a lot, like, which one do you use uh, in the context of zero knowledge? You know, do you, use an in do you give them an interactive zero knowledge proof, a non-interactive? If it's non-interactive, you know, we have a CRS, but what is a CRS? Is it a common random string or a common reference string? Uh, what kind of security do you want? Like, is it okay to have a heuristic, like, a, you know, random Oracle model po possibly, or do we need kind of, uh, you know, assumption that we strongly believe are 
uh, hold and, uh, you know, we have kind of mathematically, we believe they're true. Uh, do we give them standalone security or composable security? What parameters, which code do they use? It, it's a very, very complicated kind of question. So, okay, so what did we do? How do we start? So the, you know, the committee, a steering committee uh, was formed and the fund began. So what, what do we mean by the fund began? We met, we had uh, three meetings, uh, workshops, during these meetings. Uh, I wanna give you kind of a little bit of flavor of kind of what, what uh, went on. So, okay, we had great talks, uh, actually really interesting academic talks. Um, we had uh, several breakout discussions and during discussions, there was various things we discussed. There was one thing is kind of benchmarking security. As I said, what, what's the security? There was one kind of uh, breakout room that talked about focused on applications and there was another kind of focusing on implementation. Uh, it was really a lot of fun. A, you know, there were a lot of uh, things that's in Scruff, they're thinking, uh, Mutu kind of passionately, you know, putting out his ideas and what he thinks should be done, and a lot of kind of laughing and really a huge sense of community. Uh, one of the things that for me really struck me is how valuable it was. And this is again something that Luis pointed out in his talk, was the collaboration. And I think one thing that for me was really, really special about this entire endeavor was uh, bringing together people from such a wide spectrum. Uh, I, you know, on one extreme, there were like bankers uh, in our talks that they wanted to use, you know, zero knowledge to protect uh, their transactions. And then there were like people like me, who typically I tend to be kind of a theorist playing in my sandbox, you know, with other theorists and kind of seeing all these broad spectrum of people working together was really, really phenomenal not only in terms of, and that's when kind of for me things shifted, where in the beginning I thought of it as our duty to, you know, to tell the, the world how to use your knowledge proofs. Whereas after kind of uh, at least the first workshop, that's where things shifted and I started to think, no, actually it's, uh, it's not ours telling the, you know, the world how to use your knowledge proof, it's the world telling us what they need. And this kind of, um, you know, discussions were extremely, extremely valuable. I think for all of us, uh, I can, here's one example from my personal experience. One of the things that, for example, before this workshop, I never even thought twice about is, you know, when we can, you know, when I constructed a, I don't know, non tract zero knowledge proof, I never thought of, you know, it's a C, in the CRS model, CRS, it's, you know, the same abbreviation, whether it's common reference thing or random string, I never just, I mean, I never took, kind of the time to really pay attention to the difference between them until like practitioners were like, that's a huge difference. You know, in the real world to work with a random string is so much easier than to work with a common reference string where you need this huge MPC to join, to jointly generate this kind of reference string of, so, so all this kind of, or, or even just practitioners telling me what kind of succinct proofs they want, that they care much more about the length of the proof or much more about the runtime of the provers. It kind of made you think kind of which, what's really important for them, what parameters they want and so on and so forth. So I think this kind of collaboration and conversations between us were really, really great and formed a really nice sense of inclusion, community, and it was really, really fabulous. So as I said, at this point, kind of the vision, at least for my, I should say a disclaimer that this is kind of my, my view, okay? So, uh, uh, but for my view at this point, uh, the vision kind of changed in my head. It was more of like, oh, this is an educational thing that we need to kind of, uh, you know, it's not just here's what you should use, but it's actually, uh, you know, it's complicated. It's, there's a lot of, and we need to educate. Moreover, the, it was actually about advancing the state of the art for us, not just to get, tell, you know, the, the world what to use, but it made us kind of think of, of uh, differently about what, what we need to work on. And of course, the, what we started with, which at the end of the day, of course, the final goal was also to standardize, uh, to facilitate adoption. But essentially the goal now, uh, kind of the high level goal is really to support the field of, you know, zero knowledge and to try to mainstream it. Okay, so it became kind of a much more uh, holistic approach. I don't know. Uh, uh, so let me give you a little, a, a little more details. So Okay, so there were three workshops so far. The first of them was kind of, uh, it was uh, at MIT, I mean, in, in uh, Cambridge. 
uh, it was pretty small. We were, it was 70 of us. That's when we started working on the document where, you know, as I said, we broke into three groups, uh, security implementation and, and uh, applications. And, you know, we started kind of working each group. I was in the security group kind of trying to benchmark or think about, you know, the various questions. And we produced kind of the first document, which we called version zero. Uh, then uh, the second workshop was in Berkeley and it grew much more. There was 150 people. It was great. It was like, it was, at that point, like there were a lot of people. That's where kind of I met like various bankers from England and all these kind of people all over the industry. Uh, it was the first time where there was a call for proposals, so there were a few papers that were presented as well, and the document kind of, uh, we kept on working on the document. And the last workshop, which was supposed to be in London, but ended up being virtual, uh, was much bigger. It was 240 participants. There were 12 uh, papers. These papers were both kind of academic papers as well as kind of papers of systematics of knowledge, trying to kind of uh, think of ways that they thought of, of uh, standardization. And there you know, were working groups uh, starting to work on, the, on kind of efforts of trying to standardize uh, these proposals. So uh, this was really kind of uh, great. And all of these workshops had fantastic talks, you know, uh, breaking groups, and again, a very, very good uh, sense of, of community. Um, one thing I do want to say a little more about is, which again, I'm going to keep it very brief because I feel like it was, uh, you know, the previous two talks really, um, both Luis and Kim uh, gave kind of the spirit. But, uh, you know, we, we produced this document. It's actually a very nice document. I, I think it would be very nice to read for, for practitioners and people outside. It's also really, really nice to read as an academic working in this field. Um, but uh, so this is about an 80 some page uh, document. Uh, first, let me, I want to uh, send a huge uh, shout out. Thank you uh, for the fantastic editor. So the, uh, Daniel here and Luis here and uh, Tomer. Uh, this this uh, document was done in collaboration with many people. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it was a lot of people c contributed. Uh, NIST was involved, which was fantastic for us. And um, and, and I want to tell all of you guys that please join this effort. Uh, you know, the document is publicly available in zkproof.org. Uh, please look at it. If you have any, uh, you know, comments or you want to just join us to continue it, uh, to continue this effort, please just uh, email us at editors at zkproof.org. And we would love, this is really a community effort uh, as, as the others as well. So I, I just want to say uh, a little bit more about uh, the document, which is kind of what we've been working towards. So uh, essentially, there's been four things that we focused on. There's the security. Uh, there's the construction paradigms. How do we, which constructions do we use? And then there was implementations and applications. I mainly want to talk about the first two, I don't, as opposed to implementation and application, mainly because I'm a theorist, so I feel more comfortable talking about the things I contributed to and things I'm, I feel like I'm an expert on. So, uh, and, and the point of this is just to tell you kind of things that we were kind of thinking about and concluded with and so on. So in terms of security, uh, you know, when we started, the question was, okay, let's start with the syntax. What is the syntax of zero knowledge proof? And even here, it became very, very difficult. Uh, so first question, interactive or non-interactive? Which syntax do you give? Okay, again, like I mentioned, common random string, common reference string, which one? Do you want designated verifier or publicly verifiability? Which one? There was just, even the syntax became very, very uh, complex. Uh, and then, as I said, same thing with security. Do you want standalone security? Do you want composability? Do we want it, the proof to be deniable or do we want it to be transferable? You want, it was just kind of, uh, you know, and assumptions. Again, some of them do, some, we have even information theoretic. Some require computational. Some have a kind of a complexity step assumptions. Some are ideal model assumptions, such as random oracle or generic group assumptions. Some are post-quantum secure. Some are not post-quantum secure. So I, I see Luis kind of laughing. I, I get the sense that you dealt with very, a lot of similar issues. Um, so essentially in this document, we kind of lay out, we, we're not yet in the 
point where we're about to standardize, we're still in the process of laying out all the parameters, all the you know, pros and cons, and trying to figure out. And again, I think the situation is that different applications need different things. And so we're still kind of trying to figure out, you know, what, and of course, you're not going to standardize everything. So we're still kind of in, the, in this process. Um, so this is just in terms of, of uh, security. In terms of constructions, I think it's also very, there, it's very uh, broad. And again, there's not one construction necessarily better than the other. And the way uh, we thought of it is not just so much a specific construction, but actually like construction paradigms. So in zero knowledge, there's various kind of paradigms for constructing zero knowledge proofs. And in particular, our focus was mainly on non-interactive zero knowledge proofs. Uh, so how do you construct a non-interactive zero knowledge proofs? There are many kind of ways. Uh, there's one way to take an interactive proof and just apply fiat Mule to it. There's another way of taking a PCP proof and kind of converting it into a zero knowledge proof. Uh, by kind of uh, using Kilian Mikali type, uh, hashing it down. Uh, there's another way of doing kind of linear PCP and using it, doing kind of it in the exponent, using uh, knowledge of, um, um, a knowledge of exponent type assumptions. Uh, there's another one taking IOP, interact, uh, interactive oracle proofs, and uh, compiling them into zero knowledge. There are many kind of paradigms and we kind of looked into each and every paradigm and each and every paradigm has again different parameters and different pros and cons. Uh, you know, for example, the linear PCP, it tends to be very, very short. So if you really care about the length of the proof, that's great. Uh, the IOP uh, type construction tend to be very efficient. So if you care about the runtime of the prover and verify of the prover specifically, that may be your choice. So we're kind of we, in this document, what we did is kind of set up, or it's a working document, it's not done, it's a working, it's a work in progress, but our goal, at least in the first two things, were to set up kind of the, uh, the state of the art in a way that educational, that people can read and understand and kind of laying out the parameters, the pros and cons of everything. And similar, similar efforts were done, again, in the implementation level and in the, in the application level. And again, as I mentioned, this is still work in progress. Uh, we would love for you uh, to join us. And again, the goal is to, you know, uh, to understand these things. And once we understand exactly, you know, in different applications, the pros and cons, the goal is, of course, to, to standardize it. But we're still in the midst of this, of this effort. OK, so let me just kind of uh, uh, summarize and say that, again, this is an open initiative. Our goal is it's an open initiative. Everybody's welcome to join. It's a great community. And the goal is really to mainstream zero knowledge proofs. OK, it's a community driven standardization effort. Uh, we focus on interoperability and security. Uh, and again, it's not just about standardization. It's about kind of improving the state of the art. And we see this as kind of an ongoing, very fruitful collaboration between everyone in the spectrum from kind of you know mathematician like theorists and all the way to people just bankers or people you know industry people who just want to use use uh zero knowledge uh, for security okay so i just want to uh, send a huge thank uh, to our sponsors we've been very lucky i uh, had really uh, great uh sponsors and to the entire community who's been which has been really lovely it's been really really fun and Mainly, I want to send a huge thank you to Daniel, who's been leading uh, this entire effort from, you know, day one, and Kedit, who's been kind of supporting this in any, every possible way from, you know, organization, logis logistics, support, financial support, everything. So, yeah, it's been really, really fun. I encourage all of you to, you know, join us, uh, and I, it, fun and very, very fruitful. So, I learned a lot. I think others have learned a lot too. And yeah, I, we would love to, to have you join. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shael. Uh, it's a bit weird to see my picture in the thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, so and I should say, wait, I, I forgot one more thing. Daniel, thank you. Some of the best slides you saw here were thanks to Daniel. I stole his slides from various things. So thank you. That's um, we have time for one question. Does anybody have a 
Any question? Can I, Luis? Ask, can I ask a question? Um, so thank you for the talk, Yahel. Um, I, I found interesting your progressive perspective of thinking this is going to be easy and then, whoops, yeah. then suddenly something opens. So you mentioned that um, you kind of were surprised that suddenly you're getting new research questions arising from looking at this from this perspective. Do you think there's a chance of ever converging or is this like an open thing that will never, will always keep on having more interest and having more possibilities to explore? You know, I think, uh, you know, I think of it actually, I think of it as ever evolving, but I'm not sure it's going to ever evolve in the like zero knowledge proofs that we know today. I think in general, you know, I, th this is a general, my view of research in general. Uh, when you ask a question, it, I view it always as ever evolving, but at some point of the evolution, it becomes a totally different question. So, you know, it's kind of, um, I, I, I see it as ever, ever evolving, but where to and when it will con diverge from being kind of zero knowledge, what we think of today and a totally different thing that I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think one thing that I did learn from this effort is the holistic, like taking, you know, people that are interested from all over the spectrum, you know, like this holistic approach of sitting together and talking about the questions and what pe different people asking questions is extremely valuable. Uh, so I, I wish, I hope to see that in, you know, in e every possible area in cryptography. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis, for the question. And again, thank you, Yael. It's a round of applause to Yael. How do I? Um, ah. I don't know how to unshare my, oh, stop share, okay, sorry. Thank That's you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Tancred, would you like to introduce our next speaker? Yes, sure. So, um, so since, uh, you know, uh, adoption and standardization is not only about uh, standards, but it's also about the legal context in which uh, this contribution exists. We invited, and we're really lucky to have Alexandra Wood from uh, Harvard University, who's going to talk about integrating the legal and technical reasoning for privacy analysis. So Alexandra Wood is a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, and she's a, a senior researcher collaborating with the Harvard Privacy Tool Project. So our research explores, you know, uh, new and existing regulatory framework for data privacy and how they relate to privacy emerging technology from other fields. So thank you very much, Alexandra, for your talk and looking forward to it. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this discussion today. Um, I'll try to share my screen. Okay, um, I'm pleased to share an overview of research seeking to combine legal and technical reasoning for a rigorous privacy analysis with promising applications for both regulation and practice. Um, before I begin, I should note that the research I'm speaking about today is not a solo effort. It's the product of an interdisciplinary working group bringing together computer scientists, information scientists, legal scholars, across multiple institutions in order to tackle questions at the intersection of legal and computer science approaches to privacy. This research is motivated by the emergence of a new privacy enhancing technology, differential privacy. Though many of the arguments I'll make in this talk are reflective of more general problems at the intersection of emerging technologies and the law. As Many in this audience are undoubtedly familiar. Differential privacy arose from a new line of research in theoretical computer science that began around 17 years ago. In 2006, Dwork, McSherry, Nassim, and Smith uh, introduced the concept of differential privacy. And today it's perhaps the most widely studied formal privacy concept as a rich theory and it's now in its first stages of implementation with real world use by federal statistical agencies such as the US Census Bureau and companies such as Google, Apple, Uber, and others. 
Um, the largest implementation is coming up soon on the horizon with the deployment of differential privacy as the primary disclosure avoidance mechanism for the 2020 decennial census. The emergence of this new technology presents a practical challenge. Formal privacy models offer a solution for providing wide access to statistical information with strong guarantees that individual level information will not be leaked inadvertently or due to an attack. And this is very promising because it addresses weaknesses of traditional approaches to privacy and it's supported by a, a rich formal theory. However, emerging technologies cannot confidently be used to share sensitive data in the real world without assurance that they satisfy regulatory standards with some degree of certainty. Um, one might argue on its face um, that differential privacy because it's a more robust privacy solution than any prior technology of its nature that should be considered sufficient to satisfy a regulatory requirement for privacy protection, at least where less protective approaches were previously deemed sufficient. Um, but if you look closely, the answer is arguably not very straightforward. Um, this is because generally privacy regulations are ill-defined. Um, there's no precise definition of de-identification or for related concepts such as personally identifiable information. Um, information privacy laws are context specific, they're subject to interpretation, they allow for some degree of flexibility, and they rely on traditional, often heuristic conceptions of privacy. Um, because these concepts are heuristic, they must be periodically updated in response to newly discovered weaknesses. Um, so Privacy standards based on these heuristic concepts become moving targets, um, creating uncertainty for practitioners and for the individuals in the data. Um, so I'll briefly go over some of these, uh, these gaps that we've identified in more detail. Um, one gap is in the generality of the protection afforded. Regulatory requirements for privacy protection vary according to industry sector, jurisdiction, institution, types of information involved, and other contextual factors. For example, the law that protects education records in the United States, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, or FERPA, protects only a limited class of information from education records maintained by educational agencies and institutions, as I'll describe later on in this presentation. But in practice, privacy risks are not limited solely to the information categories and contexts contemplated in the law, and interpreting and applying regulatory standards is challenging in cases where and analyst seeks to combine data from multiple sources. In contrast, formal privacy models like differential privacy can be applied wherever statistical or machine learning is used, um, regardless of the type of information involved. There's also a gap in the scope of the tax contemplated. Privacy regulations and related guidance contemplate a limited set of specific attacks and privacy failure modes. As one example, many regulations make an implicit assumption that re-identification by a record linkage is the primary or even sole privacy failure mode. Uh, these requirements are often interpreted as requiring the protection of information one can foresee being used in a record linkage attack. A prominent example is the Tanya Sweeney's re-identification attack in 1996 on the Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission release of anonymized records summarizing information about hospital visits made by state employees. Sweeney found just one record in the anonymized medical claims data set that matched Massachusetts Governor William Weld's gender, zip code, and date of birth, a combination which she determined was likely unique through the use of publicly available voter registration records, and this made it possible for her to mail the governor a copy of his personal medical records. And this high profile demonstration had a sweeping influence on the development of privacy regulations in the United States. Um, the most direct example is the HIPAA privacy rule, which includes a safe harbor method for de identifying private health information. Uh, this requires the removal of certain pieces of demographic information, including date of birth and zip code, and it was inspired by Latanya Sweeney's demonstration. However, in the last two decades, researchers have identified new attacks. In some cases, learning whether an individual participated in a research study could be considered a privacy violation, even if the individual's exact information cannot be identified. 
Um, there are other types of privacy attacks, such as singling out an individual, even if not fully identified, or inferring information um, with less than absolute certainty. Privacy regulations that focus on re-identification by a record linkage can fail to address this broader understanding of privacy, whereas formal privacy models provide protection against a wide collection of privacy attacks, even those not currently known. There are also gaps between lay expectations and the scientific understanding. Regulatory standards that rely on the concept of de-identification to protect privacy are often not in agreement with the current scientific understanding. For example, the HIPAA privacy rule is now understood to be a weak standard. Research has demonstrated that re redaction of identifiers can fail to protect privacy, especially when applied to information that's very detailed, such as that found in medical records. In fact, it's now understood that any information about individuals, including information not traditionally considered to be identifying has the potential to leak information specific to individuals. And this issue is not limited to HIPAA, um, as many legal standards of privacy rely on concepts of de-identification and personally identifiable information. And in some cases, the law may even be interpreted to require something that's not technically feasible, such as absolute privacy protection when sharing data. Such a binary view of privacy, whereby information is either identifiable or not, is common to many regulations. And this is problematic because information can never be made completely non-identifiable. And this fails to recognize that privacy loss accumulates with successive releases of information about the same individuals. Uh, in contrast, formal privacy models bound the privacy leakage of each release and the total privacy leakage across multiple releases. Finally, there are gaps regarding the concept stability or instability over time. Notions of privacy embedded within regulatory standards are continually evolving in response to new discoveries. Uh, practitioners seeking to implement privacy safeguards in accordance with these regulations face a moving target. Um, if you consider, for example, the Office of Management and Budgets data breach guidance for federal agencies, um, revisions were made to this guidance in 2017 to clarify that information that's not personally identifiable information can become personally identifiable information whenever additional information becomes available in any medium or from any source that would make it possible to identify an individual. This approach to defining the scope of information to be protected requires regulatory and policy standards to be updated as new attacks are identified, um, much like the penetrate and patch approach to patching software incrementally as new bugs are discovered. But when a regulatory definition is periodically amended over time, it's an indication that the definition is not a strong general definition. In contrast, differential privacy is the subject of ongoing scientific research and Regardless of implementation, there's a strong assurance that it provides a sufficient level of privacy in a wide variety of settings. Um, so in light of the significant conceptual gaps underlying existing legal and technical approaches, this may seem to be an intractable problem. They're very different languages. Um, however, with our research, we argue that there are opportunities for bridging the gap between these different approaches. We've demonstrated um, the feasibility of this approach by formally modeling the requirements of a privacy law FERPA, and then proving that use of a particular privacy technology, like differential privacy, is sufficient to satisfy these requirements. This approach to formal modeling has two steps. Uh, the first is to extract a formal mathematical requirement of privacy based on a standard found in an information privacy law and the second is to construct a rigorous mathematical proof for establishing that a technological privacy solution satisfies the mathematical requirement that we derive from the law. I'll give a brief overview of the process using an illustration of a formal modeling of FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. The goal is to extract a formal model in the form of a game-based privacy definition. And this has certain advantages. It provides a concise and fairly intuitive abstraction of FERPA's privacy requirements. And if we're able to prove that a formal model such as differential privacy satisfies the game-based definition we derive, then we also have a strong argument that, form, that the formal privacy model satisfies the requirements of FERPA. 
FERPA, of course, was not written with a privacy game framework in mind, um, but we argue that it's possible to extract a game based on its requirements. Um, I'll begin first with FERPA's definition of personally identifiable information, um, which includes a non-exhaustive list of direct and indirect identifiers, plus, and this is the key language for our analysis, other information that alone or in combination is linked or linkable to a specific student that would allow a reasonable person in the school community who does not have personal knowledge of the relevant circumstances to identify the student with reasonable certainty. The definition of personally identifiable information is critical because FERPA permits the release of de-identified information without consent once all personally identifiable information has been removed. Um, and in addition to de-identified information, FERPA also allows the release of directory information. Um, this includes names, addresses, contact information, awards, clubs, photos, and other information you might expect to find in a school directory or yearbook. It's helpful to think of de-identification in terms of a computation. In other words, FERPA requiring the removal of identifying attributes can be seen as requiring a computation to redact those identifiers from the input data. Framing it in this way helps model a law's requirements using the formal language used in computer science, making it possible to extract a mathematical definition for determining whether a computation meets the FERPA privacy standard. So how do we know um, whether a given computation provides a sufficient level of privacy protection to meet the requirements of FERPA? Um, we construct a game, and a simplified version of this game is presented on this slide. Uh, the game entity provides the adversary with directory information and the computation with the directory information plus uh, the, the private non-directory personally identifiable information. The computation result passes through the game entity to the adversary and the adversary makes a guess of the private information and wins if the guess of the private information equals the private information. And I'll briefly describe how we model each of the components of the game. Um, as an example, consider how directory information is modeled based on the regulatory language. Um, because it's ambiguous, we interpreted it as conservatively as reasonably possible, erring in favor of the adversary. The definition of directory information can vary. Um, each school designates certain types of information as directory information. And we can make assumptions about what information um, is likely to be considered uh, directory information. But circumstances could change. For example, social media account names could in the future be considered directory information. So instead of defining directory information, we let the attacker choose what constitutes directory information. Um, the model of the attacker comes from the definition of personally identifiable information. A reasonable person in the school community who does not have personal knowledge of the relevant circumstances. This is taken as FERPA's implicit adversary. We also know from guidance that with respect to this definition, we should not assume anything about the skill level of the adversary. We should assume that the standard is based on the knowledge of a member of the school community, which is stronger than one based on the knowledge of any reasonable person. And we know that the adversary can have both high level knowledge, like school demographics, as well as insider knowledge about specific individuals in the school community. This allows us to model the adversary's knowledge. The adversary clearly has knowledge and potentially a lot of it, but by definition does not have personal knowledge of the relevant circumstances. So this means the adversary has access to information that's publicly available, but has some uncertainty about private student information. We model this uncertainty by a probability distributions. Um, the adversary associates with each student a probability distribution that represents her knowledge about the private information of that student, and we allow the adversary to choose those statistics. For example, if Alice comes from a school where 50% of the students failed the state math proficiency exam, then the adversary might associate with Alice a distribution that has her failing the exam with a probability of 0.5. Um, putting all of Ale the- Alexandra, you yes. have uh, two, two minutes left before we have a couple of questions. Okay, great. Um, putting all these components of the game together, we're able to reason with high confidence about whether the use of a particular privacy technology satisfies FERPA. 
we can prove mathematically that any computation that's differentially private meets this definition. And since the requirements of the definition are likely stricter than that of FERPA, this satisfies the privacy requirements of FERPA as well. Um, the takeaways from the results of this research suggest more generally that adopting and understanding a privacy that's consistent across its technical and normative dimensions will be critical to ensuring personal data are adequately safeguarded over the long term. Um, a promising new research direction is to develop hybrid legal technical concepts and modes of analysis. Um, a significant challenge to standardizing and scaling privacy practices arises from the dual legal technical nature of privacy concepts. Concepts such as anonymization and de-identification are neither purely legal nor purely technical. Um, the gaps um, between legal and technical understanding also create challenges for arriving at a universal notion of privacy. Um, normative concepts embedded in existing regulatory requirements rely on intuitive assumptions about how pieces of information interact rather than and often contradicting scientific and mathematical principles. Um, this can lead to expressions of unrealistic privacy desiderata leading practitioners to pursue an idealized privacy goal that's impossible to achieve. Um, and at the same time, purely technical approaches may adopt a narrow view of privacy that fails to capture the fundamental normative expectations of privacy. Bridging these gaps will be necessary to ensure robust privacy protection in practice. Um, a significant first step is to recognize that privacy concepts have this hybrid nature. They're neither purely legal nor purely technical, but rather a multi-dimensional combination of the two. Um, an example of work in this direction is the concept of contextual integrity introduced by Helen Nissenbaum to capture the technical normative nature of privacy. Um, but though this approach um, can be used where it's possible to encode norms formally and determine where a particular information flow respects these norms, um, normative concepts are often not defined explicitly in this way. Um, and when they are, they're not expressed in a formal language that enables um, a precise analysis. So more research is needed to develop these hybrid concepts. Um, the proposed approach involves modeling the concept mathematically and then checking whether the modeling agrees with the legal analysis. If it does, one can proceed by comparing the mathematical model of the concept to a technical definition in order to demonstrate whether the technical definition meets definition of the privacy concept extracted from the regulation or literature. Um, and I'll just point to um, recent work by Aloni Cohen and Kobe Nisim to formalize the anonymization concept of singling out found in recital 26 of the EU's general data protection regulation. Their analysis identifies a tension between a common intuitive theory of singling out and a mathematical analysis. And they introduce a new formal mathematical concept called predicate singling out and demonstrate how to make determinations regarding the sufficiency of specific technologies for satisfying regulatory requirements um, for anonymization, including anonymity and differential privacy. Um, and I'll leave you with um, some um, citations if you're interested in reading more about this work. Thank you very much, Alexandra. This was extremely interesting. Um, are there any questions in the audience? There doesn't seem to be any on the tool. May I ask a question, Daniel? Uh, thank you for the presentation, Alexandra. Uh, so if I understood correctly, what is being done uh, up to this point is mostly looking at the law and see if it can be modeled in a particular way and then implement some method. Do you, from what you've done so far, do you envision the possibility that at some point differential privacy actually becomes standardized to the point where the law then, then is actually able to refer to differential privacy once it becomes something so natural to discuss because it's standardized? Absolutely. And I think as a, a general definition of privacy, differential privacy is an excellent candidate for that. It's it's designed as a standard to begin with. Um, so it would be something that regulators could point to as, as a standard, as opposed to a more context specific judgment based sort of determination um, like privacy standards have been in the past. Um, 
and we've done some work going in the other direction um, where we're trying to um, look at technical concepts like composition. So one of the papers listed on the slide looks at the technical concept of composition, of how privacy risk accumulates with successive data releases, and then um, see what we could learn about developing a legal standard based on the concept, the technical concept of composition. Um, but that work is still very preliminary. Thank you. By the way, this question, this question goes, uh, is applicable also to zero knowledge proofs and others, right? When will laws start referring? You have to use this type of zero knowledge proof to protect something. Yeah. Well, uh, if there are any more questions, maybe we could take them on the chat of, or just um, you can uh, feel free to, to connect with Alexandra. We are now going to go on a social event. So the link uh, should be in the uh, schedule, uh, registration schedule. And uh, we are going to be back in about 15 minutes. Um, but keep in mind that it's a different link. It's a different Zoom uh, room. So it's not this one. It's not the same one. So thank you again to all the speakers for this session. Uh, thank you, Alexandra, for joining us and, and sharing your research with us. Thank you. Thank you guys for organizing. It's great. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, Luis. And thank you, Kim. See you all soon. <laughs>